The Committee on Homeland Security Subcommittee on Emergency Management and Technology will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to provide members the opportunity to evaluate the work of DHS's Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office and the Office of Health Security to assess their respective roles in preventing, mitigating, and responding to chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Today, the Subcommittee on Emergency Management and Technology will review the Department of Homeland Security's Counting, Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office and the Office of Health Security and examine their efforts to secure this great nation from weapons of mass destruction. I'd like to welcome our witnesses. Thank you for your work to protect this great nation from chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. We look forward to hearing from each of you. The Department of Homeland Security was created following the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, and brought together 22 federal agencies to coordinate and streamline efforts to protect our homeland. Shortly after the Twin Towers collapsed, a series of letters laced with anthrax were sent to congressional office buildings, news outlets, and postal facilities, killing five Americans and injuring 17. The 2001 anthrax attacks highlighted the means to which bad actors will go to terrorize innocent people and the need for the U.S. investment in CBRN security and defense. 23 years later, the risk of biological terrorism and weapons of mass destruction has not gone away. Recognizing the need to streamline and prioritize countering CBRN threats, the CWMD office was established in 2017 and authorized by Congress and President Trump in 2018. The mission of the Department of Homeland Security's Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office is to reduce vulnerability and protect American cities from a WMD attack by supporting operational partners on the ground. For example, CWMD's Securing the Cities program has equipped state and local agencies with nearly 48,000 items and pieces of equipment with detection and deterrence capabilities to protect communities across this country from radiological threats. In October 2023, a Houston police officer discovered dangerous levels of radiation in a metal scrapyard after his STC-provided personal radiation detector detected radiation during his commute to work. The hazardous material was identified and safely removed. These capabilities are critical for safeguarding this great homeland. Last July, I attended the Securing the Cities annual conference where emergency managers from across the country gathered for training and coordination. I was grateful to attend and proud of STC's work to fortify a network of state, local, and federal partners that are committed to defending the United States of America from a potentially catastrophic nuclear or radiological attack. In October, CWMD held a chem prep program in Nassau County to review local chemical incident-related concerns, gaps, and vulnerabilities to discuss potential opportunities to optimize local preparedness. I was very pleased with the local outreach and support to first responders on Long Island, the same island that members of this committee on both sides of the aisle, myself, Congressman Lolota, Congressman Garbarino, and now Congressman Swazi represent. With numerous bad actors and threats confronting our nation, CWMD has provided U.S. Customs and Border Protection with radiation portal monitors to scan cargo for potential threats. While the CWMD office plays an essential role in equipping state and local partners with equipment and training to counter CBRN threats, there are opportunities to improve the effectiveness of this office. Although the office was established to streamline internal DHS operations and coordinations with states and localities, many reorganizations have taken place and workplace morale has consistently received low rankings by CWMD office personnel. When the Department of Homeland Security Act was passed in 2002, Section 872 allowed the Secretary to reorganize, establish, or consolidate operations within the department. In 2022, the Secretary used this authority to reallocate some health security and biosecurity functions to the newly created Office 
of health security. Less than five years since the Office of Health Affairs was reorganized into CWMD. Such constant restructuring can be confusing and frustrating for employees and stakeholders. I'm looking forward to learning more about the Office of Health Security, the benefit of his move out of CWMD, and differentiating between the biodefense work of OHS with that of CWMD. I am also to eager to hear an update on CWMD's BioWatch program, which is monitor a monitoring system that collects and tests air samples for biological agents that may be used in a bioterrorism attack. This program has not kept pace with technological advancements since it was first created in response to the 2001 anthrax attacks and requires 12 to 36 hours before successfully verifying a biological agent and warning the public. In 2019, DHS began a major acquisition program, Biological Detection for the 21st Century, BD21, to move toward the next generation of national biodetection. BD21 was intended to address some of BioWatch's limitations, including significantly shortening its time to detect. However, it seems that BD21 has been abandoned. The President's fiscal year 2025 budget request refers to the program as, quote, obsolete and states that CWMD will transition into a new, quote, environmental biodetection capability development and maturation project. I would like to understand how this new project will be different. Ultimately, I hope that CWMD is on a fast track to finally obtaining the biological te technology that America needs. Despite the obstacles the CWMD office has faced, I believe that we should work together to remedy these challenges and to help the office succeed in its mission of enabling operational partners in preventing WMDs from ever harming this great country. That is also why I was proud to introduce H.R. 3224, a bill to extend the authorization of this office, and I urge my colleagues in the Senate to take up this bill immediately. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on the opportunities and challenges confronting the CWMD office, as well as the Office of Health Security. Thank you all for this work in this field and for your commitment to this country. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman, and my good friend from Louisiana, Mr. Carter, for his opening this evening. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, and good afternoon to our uh, panel experts. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today to discuss the importance of countering weapons of mass destruction and the Office of Health Security. CWMD and OHS plays a critical role in fortifying our nation's defense against the threats that can pose considerable harm to our communities. CWMD improves our nation's capability to plan for, detect, and guard against chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. OHS is the central office that serves as the principal medical, work, medical workforce health and safety and public health authority for some 260,000 Department of Homeland Security employees. Pursuant to CWMD Act of 2018, the office was set to sunset on December 21st, 2023, but the sunset was subsequently extended, and now it's set to expire when the continuing resolution expires, which is on this Friday. I want to thank uh, my friend and chairman, D'Esposito, for working in a bipartisan manner um, in front to reauthorize CWMD. I'm proud to co-sponsor his bill, H.R. 3324, the Counter and Weapons of Mass Destruction Extension Act of 2023. As authorizers, would, we should do our part to make sure that all programs and offices have support and there is no question as to whether this office or any other office that protects the nation from threats has an uncertain future. We should always, uh, our number one job is to make sure that we properly fund and provide the resources to keep America safe. Notwithstanding whatever party or philosophical views we may have, uh, this is in fact one of the most significant bipartisan issues that, that we have to undertake. CWMD operates critical programs like Securing the Cities, STC, which provides um, 14 local govern governments, including my hometown. I was proud to be the lead sponsor on 
this bill, and I know, uh, Ms. Callahan, that you had the opportunity to, to visit uh, New Orleans to do a walkthrough, so I hope you had a chance to enjoy the weather, the food, and of course the warm hearts of the people of, of New Orleans. Um, my hometown with detection equipment training, uh, uh, exercise support, operational and technical subject matter expertise, and programmatic support is so critically important to making sure that things like the Super Bowl and Mardi Gras uh, and high um, populated activities are safe, uh, not just in New Orleans, but across the country and certainly in the other 14 cities that are part of the STC. STC is working with New Orleans to prepare for the Super Bowl. Uh, we continue to support important events like Mardi Gras, Jazz Fest, Sugar Bowl, uh, any other reason uh, we have millions and millions of people who visit New Orleans for their uh, the, the hospitality and the wonderful access to transportation um, and our world-class convention center. Shameless plug there. But, uh, uh, but we're also obviously very excited about having this extra uh, barrier of protection because we know the threats are in fact real. Uh, I introduced H.R. 443, the Securing the Cities Improvement Act, which passed the House earlier this month. My bill will help cities build and maintain their security capabilities against nuclear or radiological threats. Uh, I look forward to discussing the STC's impacts on domestic preparedness. While CWMD is doing great work, one concern that I have seen highlighted repeatedly in the Partnership for Public Service and the Government Accountability Office, GAO, report is internal morale issues. One GAO reports highlighted the, the merger of predecessor offices under CWMD caused low morale and that the office's missions were unclear under the new structure. Some employees had difficulty understanding how their missions should align under the new structure. However, a more recent GAO report has highlighted that CWMD is working on its workforce morale. I want to thank GAO for their work on helping the committee understand how this new office is functioning. I look forward to hearing today from CWMD uh, how you have improved your workforce morale. OHS is also an integral part of the department and was formerly part of CWMD until 2022. As a separate component, OHS optimizes the health, wellness, and safety of the DHS workforce and enhances efforts to counter health threats that pose risk to our nation. In recent years, they have managed medical and public health initiatives to help thousands of people resettling in the United States through Operation, uh, Operations Allies Welcome to Welcome and Uniting for Ukraine. It is imperative to recognize and support the critical work carried out by both CMD, CWMD, and OHS in securing our homeland. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today regarding the recent, recent fiscal year 2025 budget request and any additional concerns and successes the office would like to discuss. Um, we're here to serve. We're here to hear from you. We're here to determine how we as a committee can do more to make sure that your jobs are, are easier to do and that you're funded to do the things that, uh, that you are uh, constitutionally mandated to do, and that is to make sure that we have a safe and wholesome community. So with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. Other members of the subcommittee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. I am pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today on this very important topic critical to our national security. I ask that our witnesses please rise and raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the Committee on Homeland Security of the United States House of Representatives will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Thank you. I would now like to formally introduce our witnesses. The Honorable Mary Ellen Callahan serves as the Assistant Secretary for the Department of Homeland Security's Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office. CWMD leads DHS efforts to safeguard the United States of America against chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. Previously, Ms. Callahan served as the Chief of Staff to the Deputy Secretary of the Department. Dr. Herbert Wolf 
is the acting chief medical officer and acting director of the Office of Health Security for DHS. He oversees the medical, public health, and workforce health and safety activities across the department. Prior to the establishment of OHS, he served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health Security within CWMD. Dr. Tina Juan Sherman is a director in the Government Accountabilities Office, Homeland Security and Justice Team. She oversees work on the protection of the nation's critical infrastructure assets, the security of the United States transportation system, and additional equities within the Department of Homeland Security including the CWMD office. I thank all the witnesses for taking the time and being here with us today. I now recognize Ms. Callahan for five minutes to summarize her opening statement. Chairman D'Esposito, Ranking Member Carter, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Department of Homeland Security's Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office and our efforts to safeguard the nation from chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats, also known as CBRN. The DHS CWMD office has a unique value proposition in the CBRN space. CWMD was created by Congress five years ago to be a single point of, CW, of CBRN expertise within DHS. We are the hub for the department's Weapons of Mass Destruction, or WMD, CBRN activities, providing coordination, strategy and policy guidance, intelligence analysis, operational support, and researching technologies. With your support, the creation of an office solely focused on CBRN threats streamlined the ability of DHS to resource and execute this critical mission. My priorities for the office include focusing on the outstanding CWMD employees, and bolstering our, our relationships with our important state, local, and federal partners. I've been leading CWMD for eight months. The workforce at CWMD is among the most talented, mission-focused, and knowledgeable workforces I have ever experienced. At its founding, however, the office faced challenges, including frequent leadership changes, faltering morale, and staff turnover. Therefore, my first priority at CWMD is to further build a collaborative, safe, and productive work environment. The CWMD team deserves this. With that said, the uncertainty around CWMD's future has had a devastating effect on the morale and retention of the office's highly skilled and in-demand workforce. My employee morale and well-being plan has three elements. First, we've been encouraging professional development, including individual development plans and professional training. We've just launched a, pro a mentoring program where I am among the mentors. Second, we are working to better integrate the activities of each of the five directorates to make sure that the CWMD staff has complete awareness of the office missions. As a result of education and communication, I've seen better synergies and coordination between and among the directorates which leads to a more engaged workforce. Third, we are looking for ways to connect with our colleagues on a more personal note. We host quarterly in-person get-togethers and are establishing interest groups. I hold weekly office hours to engage with the workforce one-on-one. -on -one. All of these actions are playing a significant role in improving CWMD's employee morale. However, without enduring reauthorization, CWMD will likely face steady attrition. In addition to better integrating my office, I'm committed to strengthening our assistance to and our relationship with our stakeholders, including our state, local, and federal partners. CWMD has integrated the prevention and detection of all CBRN threats with our DHS partners through training, equipment, and technical assistance to CBP, HSI, TSA, Coast Guard, and Secret Service. We also serve as a peer organization to CISA and FEMA in the life cycle of CBRN incident management. We, of course, work seamlessly with our colleagues at the Office of Health Security on public health and biological threats. I'm working to further the operational, uh, for, further integrate the operational support of all of these components with our planning, research, and support work at CWMD. Even with all this federal activity, the most unique role CWMD plays in the CBRN ecosystem is our relationship with state and locals. 
CWMD provides radiological and nuclear detection capabilities in 14 high-risk regions in the U.S. through the Securing the City programs. Those regions are preparing to work seamlessly with the FBI and the Department of Energy in the event of an, of an incident. On Monday, as I was in New Orleans, along with Representative Carter's team and the FBI and DOE, uh, in order to see a portion of the CBRN preparation for the 2025 Super Bowl, along with city and state teams. Last year, Securing the City trained over 14,000 state and local first responders. Our BioWatch program is in over 30 jurisdictions. We are working to update our environmental biodetection capabilities, all while providing steady state coverage for these jurisdictions. Between Securing the City and BioWatch, CWMD provides steady state detection for 40% of the population. For the rest of the country, our mobile detection deployment team was deployed 188 times last year, providing support in 48 states, two territories, and one tribal unit. All of this work with our stakeholders is intended to prepare and promote collective readiness and to safeguard the nation from CBR on our threats in the homeland. Chairman, Ranking Member, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Ms. Callahan, and thank you for your work. I now recognize Dr. Wolf for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Chairman D'Esposito, Ranking Member Carter, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the great work being done by the dedicated personnel of the Office of Health Security, or OHS. It's truly an honor to be here today to talk about the work that we are doing. I have served as the Acting Chief Medical Officer and Acting Director since January of 2023, and prior to that as the Deputy Chief Medical Officer and Deputy Director since the office creation of 2022. I joined the department in 2019 after nearly 30 years of federal public service. The challenges of the past five years exemplify how nearly every homeland security threat has a health security nexus. From acts of terror to a global pandemic, surges in migration, cyber attacks directed at critical infrastructure, including healthcare, natural disasters across the country to international response efforts spanning nearly every continent. DHS is at the center of it all and often operating as the lead federal agency. To answer the enduring health security challenges we face, DHS established OHS in July of 2022 to serve as the principal medical workforce health and safety and public health authority for DHS. The dedication of our staff and our earnest response to these challenges reflect the earnest or enduring impact, hope, and vision of OHS. One that is grounded in agility, subject matter and technical expertise, deep relationships with our interagency and state and local partners, and an unwavering commitment to the physical and mental health resiliency of our workforce in the nation. Today, OHS positions the department to have a proactive, unified, and robust response to the ever-evolving health security landscape. Health security is, after all, a core tenet of Homeland Security. The over 260,000 dedicated men, women, and working animals of the department work tirelessly to secure the nation from the many threat, threat, threats we face. The office that I'm privileged to lead, which is comprised of exceptionally talented medical, public health, and workforce health and safety experts, collaborates with leaders from across the department, the interagency, and with our state and local partners to strengthen the nation's health security while providing for a safer and healthier DHS workforce. Health, after all, is our greatest possession, and I'm proud to serve alongside many who are leading and championing the physical, mental, and work-life health of the DHS workforce, including those on the front line. Those in the workforce that we serve include 90,000 frontline law enforcement officers and agents, 44,000 U.S. Coast Guard uniform members, 4,000 EMTs and paramedics, 640 United States Public Health Service Commission Corps officers, 60,000 civilian employees who are veterans, and 4,000 four-legged employees of the department. We also provide leadership and oversight of DHS medical and public health policy, standards of care, and healthcare services provided to non-citizens, ensuring the delivery of high-quality care to those in our custody. I stand in awe and am humbled by the commitment of my OHS colleagues. I've had the privilege to lead them as we mobilize to stand up our domestic public health measures in response to the Ukraine-Russia conflict, to deploy to the southwest border to provide technical public health assistance and implementation of care improvement actions, to build on the lessons learned from Operation Allies Welcome, to work tirelessly with our partners on the Food Security is Homeland Security mission, to plan for and enable better preparedness and response to the health and medical impacts of CBRN, to ensure we optimize mental health and wellness resources for our workforce, to leverage research and development and academic partners to develop approaches to known and novel health threats, to harness technology to provide high-quality data 
uh, and analysis to program managers and decision makers, and last but not least, to assist our EMTs and paramedics on missions around the United States, and so much more. Chairman, ranking member, and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the incredible, talented, and dedicated team at OHS that works at the intersection of health security and homeland security, as well as all the public health, medical, and workforce health and safety teammates across the department, we thank you for your support. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. I now recognize Dr. Sherman for five minutes to summarize her opening statement. Chairman Diaz-Fazito, Ranking Member Carter, member of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me today to speak on behalf of my agency, the U.S. Government Accountability Office. The intentional use of chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons remain real-world threats for those domestically and abroad. The risks posed by those weapons are significant, and each one is unique in terms of their ability to be detected, prepared for, mitigated, and recovered from. Five years into its, ex its existence, the Department of Homeland Security's Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office carries out the difficult mission of enabling operational partners at the federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial levels to promote the readiness for and prevention of the use of weapons of mass destruction against the United States. The last time GAO testified about CWMD in front of this committee in 2021, we reported that the office needed to help integrate and coordinate the department's chemical defense activities. CWMD has efforts underway to identify and harmonize those activities across the department. This is even more critical given the stoppage in chemical security inspections resulting from the lapse in authorization for DHS's Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards Program. We also told this committee that CWMD faced information gathering and collaboration challenges as part of the National Biosurveillance Integration Center. NBIC has since enha enhanced its ability to collect information using open source data, and most of the stakeholders we recently spoke with found value in its written products. However, MBIC could take additional steps to assess the support it provides to its FSLTT partners. At that time, we additionally highlighted continued problems with BD21, the acquisition program to replace the existing BioWatch early warning system, such as the technical readiness and feasibility of the technologies for the program, given the inherent limitations and uncertainties for use in biodetection. With the BD21 acquisition now canceled, CWMD will need to forge a new path forward to replace the 20-year-old BioWatch system still operating in major metropolitan areas nationwide. We also at the time shared with the subcommittee that the Securing the Cities program, which provides equipment and training for first responders, had not clearly communicated potential program changes to or addressed risks to sustain detection capabilities for the program. In the latest report GAO is issuing today, we found that CWMD has improved in these areas and recommended it better communicate expectations and measures to participants for how the office will assess them against their new implementation plan next, next fiscal year. Lastly, we reported in 2021 that CWMD's workforce had continued to experience low morale following the merger of its two predecessor components that held differing missions expertise, and cultures. It has since also undergone another reorganization to establish the Office of Health Security, this all without permanent leadership. CWMD now has that leadership with Assistant Secretary Callahan and is continuing to take steps to strengthen employee engagement despite the uncertainty tied to CWMD's reauthorization. We remain hopeful that CWMD will remain responsive to GAO's recommendations as we continue to provide oversight support for the subcommittee and clearly demonstrate its effectiveness in meeting its mission across the range of threats it was established to address. Thank you, Doctor. Members will be recognized by order of seniority for their five minutes of questioning. An additional round of questioning may be called after all members have been recognized. I now recognize myself for five minutes. My first uh, set of questions is for um, Ms. Callahan. As I mentioned in my opening statement, Section 872 of the Homeland Security Act of 2002 allows the department uh, 
uh, to reorganize, establish, or consolidate operations. This authority was used to establish the CWMD office in 2017 and then used again uh, by the Secretary to establish the Office of Health Security in 2022. In your opinion, have the CWMD and OHS office reorganizations been successful? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, I believe both reorganizations have been successful. With regard to the CWMD office, uh, in the first instance, that was subsequently re was authorized in 2018. Bringing together all threats, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear, was crucial. Uh, it's important. It mirrors what other agencies are doing, and it brings together all uh, uh, elements to bear. It also helps support our operational components as well as our state and local stakeholders. With regard to the Office of Health Security, I'll defer to Dr. Wolf if he thinks it's a success. That'd be great. Uh, could I, uh, but of I will course. say, yeah, uh, I will say I think that um, having the Office of Health Security uh, outside of CWMD helped clarify several lanes. Obviously, they uh, do public health, health security. We do biological threats. We work together seamlessly. Sometimes OHS takes the lead. Sometimes we do. But I think getting the medical expertise outside of the office helps clarify um, uh, the OHS's role within the department. Over to you, Dr. Wolf. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, yep, yeah, Chairman, uh, related to the establishment of OHS, uh, prior to the establishment, uh, when CWMD was created, um, it only took approximately half of the medical and public health folks in the department. The remaining folks that focused on the health of the workforce went to the management directorate under the chief human capital officer. As we progressed through the second and third year and then entered uh, the pandemic, we learned that the medical and public health and workforce health and safety expertise was very small compared to a department that has 260,000 employees. So one of the great benefits of the OHS 872 was bringing together all the public health and medical activities of the department under one office and under one leadership. Right. And as we've heard, um, you know, sometimes the, uh, the, the workforce, the dedicated workforce, um, that are affected by these changes. The morale has been uh, not so great. It's been one of the things that uh, we as a committee uh, have wanted to address. So in addition to the, to the morale, and I guess if you could just touch upon why you think that's a factor, uh, what other challenges have we seen in the reorganization or the consolidation um, when decided by Secretary Mayorkas? For health, health security? Uh, it's really the same question for both of you. Yep. Uh, the employee morale, one of, uh, as I mentioned, I have three tenets, work on professional development, work on understanding the mission and how you fit into that mission and how you can advance. And then third, getting to know people on a personal level to reestablish esprit de corps. Um, I think those are important elements. I also think transparency is crucial. That is one of my philosophies. I have... Uh, Fortnightly town halls. I write a, a column every every week in the bulletin. I try to be available. Okay. I have one-on-one -on -one offices to go and make sure you, they know what's going on and that we can be transparent. I will note my one last challenge is the threat of termination. Um, what weighed heavily on us in the fall, and we can speak about that later. Yep. Herb. Yeah, Chairman, one of the benefits we had at OHS is we got to do the 872 second after CWMD. And so one of the things we could do even prior to the establishment is use GAO best practices and learn from other federal reorganizations. So we have not um, had the same challenge when it comes to morale. Few things that we've done, one is employee engagement. We've done a monthly survey prior to the establishment. We continue that today. The second thing we've done is we do a monthly all hands. The last thing is um, our monthly pulse survey and the FEV scores, which is the first time in 2023 that OHS was its own office, mirror relatively good scores. Our employee engagement um, and our employee experience index is above 75. Uh, we've had uh, greater than 90% of the surveys in FEVs had a score greater than 74%. And then lastly, um, in the FEV score, we had several that were above 90, and those I think are attributed to medical folks have a few core inherent missions. First, do no harm, and secondly, to help those that are in need. And so there was a real attrition uh, in there for that. Uh, to your question on challenges, I think the one we continue to face is just uh, the enduring mission of DHS and making sure that we communicate to the team uh, that we've got several communities to serve, those in our custody, the workforce, and the nation as a whole. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, my time has expired. I now recognize the ranking member for five minutes. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I find it concerning that the uncertainty surrounding the reauthorization of CWMD along with the reports of low morale can be affecting staff retention, 
and the effectiveness of CWMD's mission. Uh, Assistant Secretary Callahan, can you speak to how the reauthorization's uncertainty has impacted CWMD's employees and what long-term extension or sunset repeal would mean for your office? Thank you, Ranking Member. The, the threat of termination for the office uh, created a, a great deal of uncertainty. Um, it also created a distraction in the office in the fall. I ended up having losing 10% of my staff, which equaled over 380 years of CBRN experience, federal experience. That is a real loss. We are working quickly to replace them, but it would be difficult to recruit the talented and in-demand workforce to ask them to come and join when we have, again, the potential of a threat, a threat of termination in two years hence. Also, with regard to our state and local partners, they um, uh, experienced and expressed to me anxiety about the threat of termination. And of course, several of them are working towards the 2026 World Cup. Um, and when I was in Boston and in New York uh, recently, both of them asked about termination and, and looking forward. It is uh, a concern. It is uh, weighing on us. And as I said, this is an incredibly talented and mission-focused office. And, and it's unfair to ask anybody to work under certain these uncertain terms. We have experts that are uh, recruited to go other places. Uh, the talent pool is particularly in specified areas like this very thin. Um, so we should always endeavor to give the security of our agencies the, 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 the privilege and the authority to know that you will be able to continue to be funded and operated. Uh, I'm happy to hear that you say that. I know my colleagues are listening and we will continue to endeavor to do just that, to, to fully fund and give you the security to be able to secure us. Thank you. CWMD, Securing the Cities, STC program provides funds for uh, 14 local governments to counter successful deployment of nuclear and radiological weapons in the U.S., including my hometown of New Orleans. However, the program is limited to high-risk urban areas designated by FEMA, which can create uncertainty for local governments participating in the program. As you know, I introduced H.R. 4403, the Securing the Cities Improvement Act, which will provide more stability for STC, STC participants. I was pleased that the bill passed the House earlier this month. Assistant Secretary Callahan, could you explain why this bill is critical for the securing of cities and programs uh, more importantly? Thank you, Representative. The, we uh, support decoupling the, the securing the city's high-risk urban areas from the FEMA designation of UASI because it's, the, it's CWMD grants. We can evaluate the threats and the CBRN risks as we did with New Orleans, and we uh, support having that flexibility to identify potentially new um, uh, high-risk areas that may be included going forward. Uh, Dr. Wolf, real quickly, uh, are OHS and CWMD preparing for emerging biological threats? If so, how? Ranking member, thanks for the question. Uh, certainly, I believe that we are uh, more prepared today than we were several years ago, but challenges remain. Um, CWMD and OHS uh, share a great relationship and a partnership. Few of the areas where I would say that we have done great are looking at emerging threats and forecasting, but whether that is deliberative um, or whether that is uh, uh, unintentional. Second area we've done a great job in the biological realm is in the food, agriculture, and veterinary threat, both to food security as well as to the agriculture sector. Lastly, an area of concern that is shared uh, across the federal interagency is we've got a very taxed and strained public health and medical workforce. Most of you know hospitals run at almost capacity and run day to day on a tight operating budget. Post COVID, we've learned that the health and medical workforce is resilient, but they're also vulnerable. And so one of the areas that I share as a challenge is being sure that we are prepared, investing in the workforce, so we're prepared for the next potential public health or biological incident. Thank you, Dr. Sherman. I've got just a few seconds left, but I'd love you to, uh, first of all, thank you all for your incredible service. Um, what's your greatest fear? Uh, and what should we know as a committee to help you allay those fears? When it comes to the uh, countering of weapons of mass destruction of office. Uh, I think uh, the main, I'm not sure if I characterize it as fear, but I think one concern. Uh, area of concern. concern, we'd like the office to continue to focus on demonstrating its effectiveness. Um, there are a lot of activities uh, and efforts underway, and the office has demonstrated. Let me, let me real quickly, if one thing kept you awake at night, one thing that we, as a member of Congress, can do, this committee more specifically, can do for you and your agency 
to make your life and our lives more safe. Uh, and, and Mr. Chairman, I'll yield after she answers. All yours. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that I have a, a, a single fear that I can communicate, but I definitely feel that uh, CWMD uh, in particular has an important mission, and we definitely want to make sure to continue it in support of the subcommittee, you know, monitor its activities. So you just had a blank check in front of you. He didn't fill it in. Happy to happy to speak further about uh, you know the work that we've done in this particular office. I think one of the um, kind of main focuses we have is uh, you know these threats are real, as I said in my opening statement, um, and we are concerned about how the federal government is taking steps across uh, not only within the homeland security enterprise but across the federal government and across nationwide to be able to help address those threats. Um, and one of the challenges that we feel is. Um, is uh, experience as a result um, is the fact that there needs to be, again, a coordination, a real understanding of the range of threats to make sure that there aren't any specific capability gaps um, that exist, you know, as a result of the efforts that are underway. And we, you know, we would like to continue to work um, to ensure that CWMD is uh, helping to identify those gaps across um, the federal government as well as with SLTTs to be able to address those threats. Thank you very much, Mr. Ranking Member. And I just want to point out, um, really, to Ms. Callahan's point, and I think to concerns of all of you, the bill that, uh, my bill that came out of this committee and then passed uh, full committee in a bipartisan fashion, so I think that shows the commitment that this committee and this subcommittee has to the work that you do. Uh, it was actually a seven-year extension, um, but due to the CBO score, we also have to be realistic in what we could actually, as a as a committee and a subcommittee can get onto the floor and pass. Um, so that's why we're at the two-year number. But this committee uh, and my bill, when it was originally drafted, uh, did have a seven-year extension. And with that, I recognize uh, my good friend and fellow New Yorker and Long Islander, Mr. Lolota, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman D'Esposito, for your leadership and to our witnesses for being with us here today. Uh, like Chairman D'Esposito, I am a proud New Yorker, a proud Long Islander, uh, and I'm honored, I'm honored to represent the east end of Long Island. My district's about 50, 60 miles uh, to the east uh, of Manhattan, uh, the heart of New York City. Uh, and this coming uh, September 11th marks the 23rd anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks in lower Manhattan, uh, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and here in our nation's capital. Uh, and after that day, we as a nation collectively vowed that we would never forget that we would never allow another attack of that magnitude on American soil. Uh, however, Mr. Chairman, I'm becoming increasingly concerned that we are on the cusp of another major attack, and if we do not properly prepare, we could fail to prevent another 9-11. In fact, uh, the director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee back in December and warned Congress of another 9-11-like failure. During that hearing, he said, I quote, I see blinking lights everywhere. And ask any New Yorker, we know what that means and we'll tell you plain and simple that we're in trouble. Um, and now in addition to being a proud New Yorker, I'm a Navy veteran, uh, the brother of a Marine, and I served this country in uniform with immense pride for 11 years. And I can tell you from that experience, the most effective way to thwart an adversary and protect an asset, especially our people, is through deterrence. Uh, the action of discouraging an action uh, or an event by instilling doubt or fear into the consequences. Um, Assistant Secretary Callahan, thanks so much for being here. Uh, as the Assistant Secretary for the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office, my first question is for you. It was only five years ago that the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office within the Department of Homeland Security was established. Um, do you believe that the office has served as a deterrent for our adversaries in attempting to use a weapon of mass destruction on U.S. soil since the office was created? Representative, I do believe it has served as a deterrent, and the way it has done so is by pushing out training, equipment, and uh, exercises to the, the state and local first responders. They're going to be the ones who are going to come across a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear threat, and getting training and technology in their hands is how that we can um, uh, not only identify, but prepare and respond. Our mission is to prevent and, detect and deter uh, uh, CBRN threats, and I think we're doing so with regard to our relationship with state and locals, also in Nassau County, as well as in Suffolk County, sir, and also with, uh, with working with our operational components uh, here in the Department of Homeland Security, and then working in the interagency with FBI and DOE. Yes, sir. 
great. Um, and I know that Dr. Sherman uh, resisted the temptation to answer the question about the blank checks, uh, and then you <laughs> I'll, I'll write it. <laughs> you're going to get a shot at the same question then. Uh, how can you build on that success? And your answer just now, you said technology was a key part of what we ought to be focused on moving forward. Give Congress a sense of what else you think uh, we ought to be leveraging in technology and otherwise to be able to build on the success of the last five years. Um, sir, it's, it's technology, training, and equipment, and exercises. Getting the knowledge out for chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear threats, understanding how to respond, do the training and exercises that I witnessed in New Orleans just this week, because it's the first responders, it's those state and locals are going to be on the ground uh, if indeed something happens. Uh, and we are working to get that knowledge out as far as we can. With regard to the, the check that I will write, uh, the enduring reauthorization of the C CWMD office is crucial to make sure that we can be that linchpin for the entire um, C CWMD ecosystem. Thank you. Appreciate your feedback. You know, this committee under Chairman Diaz-Bazil's leadership has a strong bipartisan approach to how we are very grateful. To, and we're Thank gonna you. continue that, and we're committed to doing that. Thank I'm, you. Uh, gonna maybe go to a next round uh, in the future, Mr. Chairman, so I yield. Thank you, Mr. Lauda. I now represent, the re recognize, I'm sorry, uh, from Alabama and uh, first responder, Mr. Strong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member. I appreciate our witnesses for being here to discuss the important work each of you are doing to secure our nation against weapons of mass, dis uh, mass destruction. As you all know, BioWatch is one of the programs used to carry out the mission of the CWMD office by collecting and testing air samples for biological agents likely to be used in an act of bioterrorism. As technology evolves, so do threats to our country. For example, increasing access and affordability of unmanned aircraft presents ample opportunities for bad actors to cause harm and hysteria in our communities. Now more than ever, we depend on uh, efficiency and effectiveness of BioWatch. Unfortunately, this program is not operating like it should. From breakdowns to accurate information sharing to bureaucratic barriers and lagging uh, procurements of biodetection technology, DHS has fallen dangerously behind. For this reason, I introduced the DHS Biodetection Improvement Act, which would direct DHS to use every tool in its disposal to develop an uh, acquisition and procurement plan to meet the biodetection needs of the 21st century. The House passed this legis uh, legislation earlier this month, and I urge my Senate colleagues to do the same. Uh, first, uh, Assistant Secretary Callahan, uh, to what extent is BioWatch an operational program given uh, past findings of its inaccuracy in timely detection, and uh, what plan exists for improving it? Thank you, Representative Strong. BioWatch is the only uh, biodetection capability that this nation has. It has, it, it, it has existed. It is uh, a stable and functional process. We are working on improving it and looking at technology and opportunities, but it is lab-based, lab-proven, and we've worked with over 30 jurisdictions to make sure that we have a, an appropriate baseline and security. BioWatch is, is, uh, is reliable, sir. Thank you. How long uh, does it take from the moment a sensor registers a bio agent uh, to when the data is shared with partners for response? Yes, sir. The, the, the um, materials for BioWatch are collected either on a 12 or 24 hour basis and then are analyzed in the lab. From the time in the lab, it takes a few hours, somewhere between two and four hours to identify uh, whether or not there is aerosolized uh, bio, uh, biological uh, materials so 12 in the to, air. 12 to 24 hours, right? That is for the collection time. Yes, sir. Thank you. When dealing with uh, the threats of uh, bioterrorist bio attack, uh, every minute matters, every second matters. Yes, sir. And uh, the chairman, D'Esposito, highlighted uh, it can take up to 36 hours um, in, to get these results. How many times since the start of this program has there been a positive detection, and how many times has there been a false alarm? Uh, in this room, sir, um, I, I I cannot go into details, but I can talk about it in a different room. If that that would be uh, happy to take that offline, if that's okay. 
Thank you. Dr. Sherman, uh, thank you for your work uh, on reports related to BioWatch. I understand that GAO has made multiple recommendations about changes that needs to be made um, to the acquisition and uh, procurement process. Has DHS implemented any of those changes? Yes, uh, DHS has taken steps to um, better inform uh, its acquisition process. Um, and in fact, I think uh, the result of BD21, the BD21 uh, program being canceled, uh, was informed um, in part by some of the questions that we had raised in prior work and recommendations that we had made uh, regarding more informed decision making uh, during the acquisition process and not moving forward with that process and spending additional funds until there's really kind of clear evidence and documentation of effectiveness. Thank you. Other than passing the DHS Biodetection Improvement Act, what is the biggest thing DHS uh, can do right now to improve BioWatch in your judgment? What's the biggest thing they can do to improve biodetection? I will say, yeah, I will just I'll say biodetection is an incredibly <laughs> challenging task. Um, and, you know, we're talking about how long it takes to uh, be able to capture a sample and test it and confirm results. Um, you know, the extent to which there is a way to identify technologies that allow for increased efficiencies in those time frames. Um, if those exist, then that is, you know, that would be something that um, I think would uh, result in a, 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 you know, significant progress. Um, but CWND, given its current mission, you know, should be actively considering as it is how to continue their focus in um, biodefense. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, you touched on it just a second. It is um, unique that you worked as a fire chief. I've been a fire chief, uh, police, first responders. We know firsthand how critical that is that we get that information. 40 years uh, myself and uh, 34 years as an emergency medical technician. So it's uh, so critical to our first responders. And I thank each of you uh, for what you do to get that information as fast as possible. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Strong. And I recognize from Oklahoma, Mr. Keen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I uh, want to ask Dr. Sherman, representing the, representing the GAO with a Homeland Security um, specialty, tell me in terms of efficiency is something that GAO is respected for constantly analyzing. Where do you see resources being uh, expended that you the GAO would say um, may be inefficient um, and could be otherwise allocated. I'm really interested in the concept of, of the electric grid and hardening our transmission, our transformers. Um, and I'd like to hear if you think that we're being inefficient in some areas and if, if some of those resources could be otherwise utilized to uh, protect what I think is a very vulnerable grid. Sure. So um, speaking to the acquisition piece, um, you know, CWMD has um, gone through um, not only in the biodefense space, but also in the, you know, the radiation um, detection space, uh, several acquisitions that have resulted in um, cancellation. Um, and I think I mentioned it before that that's actually not necessarily a bad thing because um, if it comes to a decision point, where the officer of the department decides that um, they don't have enough information to move forward and to spend um, the taxpayer dollars um, for a particular program, that they should make a decision to not do that. So that is an area where I think uh, the office has at least taken steps and demonstrated that the, um, you know, again, the kind of the, the efficiency piece uh, is really critical in making sure that um, there isn't continued efforts over time and spending um, to be able to identify particular threats. Um, I would also say one of the themes that we have throughout um, the CBRN space for C CWMD is going back to the message about effectiveness, really understanding whether the programs and activities are working, whether the work that in the case of securing the cities, the partners that are being carried out um, in the regions having an understanding of whether or not the support that CDF, CWMD is providing, the money, the resources is actually working and better protecting um, those regions across the country. And so I think that that is a way to really understand whether or not uh, money is being well spent um, uh, as it goes towards uh, the various programs within CWMD. 
Can you expound upon that? So we're the, the expenditure of funds going to, to localities, high population areas. How is GAO determining whether or not that that is a, a good spend for the taxpayer? How do you, how do you run through the, the, how do you analyze that accurately? Sure. So in the case of securing the cities, um, for example, uh, last year, um, CWM, CWMD put out an implementation plan for its uh, program, a new version of its implementation plan. And as part of that plan, um, it, it was to, the office was to collect information from the region, regional partners uh, in terms of uh, trainings, exercises, um, uh, detections, efforts that they have made that have been tied to the resources that they've been um, provided to them. Uh, we have found that um, CWMD over time hasn't done as uh, good of a job looking at that information, collecting that information, making sure that it's accurate through quarterly reporting requirements um, and others. And so in this report that we issued today, we made recommendations around making sure that it has better data, it has better information from those partners to, to be able to say, okay, you are um, successful in the efforts that you're carrying out, being able to implement uh, this program, being able to be prepared as a first responder for detection efforts, um, and you should be able to continue forward and ideally um, obtain sustainment funding as a result of that. So I want to, because i got 40 seconds left, Mr. Chairman, I want to ask um, in regards to the, the expenditure, and next year we'll come back and have a conversation as to whether or not those suggestions from GAO were implemented. What are your thoughts, um, Ms. Callahan, in regards to, if, if is there a better allocation of resources that may not be high population centers regarding our electric grid, our the transformers? My understanding, um, there's some information floating around that says we have 20 transformers. If they were all hit at the same time, whether it's gunfire, an EMP, um, somebody walking up with a device that exploded, then we could bring down our entire electrical grid, shut down traffic, shut down cell phone utilization. Can you speak to that? Um, sir, I, we agree with all of GAO's recommendations with regards to securing the cities. With regard to electrical grid, that would be my colleagues at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. I know they have spent a, a great deal of time on that and are working on hardening that, but I'd have to defer to those, okay. uh, those colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGean. Um, Ms. Callahan, as you mentioned in your testimony, uh, CBRN threats present dynamic challenges to the nation's security. And quote, the risks are constantly evolving due to the evolution of technologies, quote. What steps has the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office taken to coordinate or <clears throat> sorry, coordinate the threat with the intelligence community so that the agency might better understand the current threat environment. Thank you, sir. As you may know, we have a dedicated intelligence shop just focused on CBRN threats. They do an annual report that we're happy to, to brief to you and to your staff, the CBRN, CWMD Homeland Threat Assessment. We work very closely with our intelligence community colleagues. We also are working having a fledgling relationship with the National Guard Bureau and their intelligence shop, again, to get that information out to the first responders, to the folks in the field, in the 57 different, for example, um, uh, civil support teams. Uh, so trying to get that information out. We're also working with our colleagues, Health, uh, health Security, among others, at, at analyzing the risk. So we've identified the threat, but we've also looked at the risk, which include the likelihood as well as the consequent and what, and what the impact is. So we're trying to make have a holistic view. Okay. Yes, sir. And, and what's your interaction uh, regularly with Customs and Border Patrol to make sure that uh, our ports, our ports of entry, um, so that they have the information necessary to make sure that they can protect us as best they can? Yep, obviously uh, CBP is one of our biggest stakeholders. We support the radiation portal monitor, so 14, oh, almost 1,400 RPMs at the ports of entries. We also go and brief them on threats. We've done multiple trainings, not only at ports of entries, but also at the National Targeting Center for that as well. Okay. Um, your testimony also speaks to chemical preparedness and chemical defense uh, and mentions the establishment of the DHS Chemical Coordination Group to, uh, quote, meet the evolving threat for chemical attacks and incidents. How has the expiration of CIS's Chemical Facilities Anti-Terrorism Standards Program affected our nation's chemical defense posture? 
Uh, yes, thank you, sir. Uh, the the uh, the termination of CFATS authorization. I know that's the wrong phrasing, but the uh, end of CFATS authorization has. Um, in my opinion, uh, affected our, our chemical readiness with regard to identifying threats that would be in chemical facilities. CFATS and CWMD are, um, are siblings, and they work together closely, and um, we are missing them uh, in, this, in, the, in this whole of government threat. And I know we briefly touched upon this in my first round of questioning, but I think it's important because I think in a, a lot of federal agencies, especially when it comes to uh, our enforcement agencies, um, Homeland Security, Customs and Border Patrol, Capitol Police, um, attrition and making sure that uh, our workforce stays is a concern that we have. So in 2022, there was uh, a ranking by best places to work, and the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office ranked 430 out of 432. Um, 430 out of 432. CWMD has consistently ha has had low ratings. Um, I know that we talked about this briefly, but I think it's extremely important. So you, I think, have had identified in some cases why morale is so low. Um, is there anything that you weren't able to share in the first round of questioning? And if we can go into, because uh, we have a little bit more time, uh, what the steps that you are taking to improve the morale to make sure that we uh, keep our uh, co-workers uh, staying where they are because I think institutional knowledge is something that is so important. Um, so what are we doing to make sure that they stay and are enjoying uh, working for this great government? Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, retention is crucial and it's incredibly important for particularly for something as complex as CBRN threats. And we're working in uh, multiple ways. I mentioned my kind of three tiers of my, my work, my morale um, plan. I won't rehash that, but I will say that we're looking for opportunities to cross-train, to have people work within the different directorates. What's interesting to me is that we've, uh, because they came from different organizations, that in some ways they might not have known the, the other side of the CB and the uh, RN threat. So we're looking at ways to integrate that better. We're doing presentations on, on what we're doing. We're looking to look for those synergies that were there but hadn't been focused on yet. And so, sir, I think it's professional development. I think it's, prof it's office development. And it's candidly just getting to know us as people. Um, we lost a lot of that during COVID, and we're trying to find ways to connect in a hybrid environment. Okay, so I, I guess we're both confident that the next time Best Places to Work does their rankings will be far better than 430. Sir, I will say the FEVs are a lagging indicator and that it could be possible that the FEV scores during my time may come out um, and, you know, after I leave, depending on the election. And so I want to say, I'm not here about FEV scores. I'm here about the people. Absolutely. Yes. I'm still confident I'm rooting for you. I, I appreciate the, <laughs> the vote of support, and I, I uh, also share that, that vote. <laughs> All right. My time's expired. Now recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I suspect that when we have the security of knowing that people will get a paycheck, that we'll also have morale to go up because government should not run from continuing resolution to continuing resolution. Um, we should have the security of people knowing that their government and the full faith and credit of their government will always be protected. Uh, and uh, so we will continue to fight to make sure that happens so you're able to do your job even more. So uh, Representative Strong touched on a point that I wanted to go. So I, uh, uh, Secretary Callahan, can you tell the subcommittee where CWMD is advancing in its biodetection capabilities? Thank you very much, sir. As I mentioned, BioWatch is a, is a reliable program right now, but we have to improve on it. As Dr. Juan Sherman said, we've got to get um, make sure that we have a, a shorter time period, if possible, with the same level of standard of, of clarity and of accuracy. Uh, we have looked at many opportunities. I'm happy to talk about BD21, but I'll put that to a side right now because it's an acquisition program. But we're looking at making a series of incremental improvements on environmental biodetection writ large. And that's our focus rather than kind of to jump to the, the BD21 moonshot, so to speak. Um, and that's that one of the reasons BD21 couldn't scale and it couldn't be operational at this moment. But instead, we're looking at a wide range of technologies, opportunities, and resources to, to have the BioWatch steady state while we work on incremental improvements in terms of timeliness, response, uh, efficiency, and so on. Are we keeping up with the bad guys? 
Um, we are working our darnest to keep up with the bad guys. Um, as uh, as uh, Dr. Juan Sherman said, uh, biodetection at scale is really hard, and it's one of the reasons why BioWatch is the only program that we, we have right now. But we're looking at we're engaging our state and local stakeholders to make sure we're meeting their mission and their mark as we look to make these improvements on, on biodetection. But biodetection is hard. Bioattacks are also hard, I will say, and stop there in this room. It's an incredible challenge. So uh, those are not uh, trick questions. They're questions that... Understood, sir. One, we understand and appreciate the difficult tasks that you have. So we'll begin there. So the questions we ask, uh, we come in peace on how we can better serve you Understood, and you can sir. better serve us. So how, how, what's your approach? You mentioned stakeholders. Um, what's your approach to collect information, data, and to learn from, and more importantly, teach like, local stakeholders and what relationship and how do you, how, what does that look like? Yep, so first our relationship with stakeholders are paramount. That's our crucial element. We are an operational support component, supporting the, the five DHS operational supports as well as all the state and locals that we've talked about. I have people on my team who communicate with state and locals every day to make sure we're transparent, we know what's going on, we're, we're communicating. With regard to the GAO recommendations on data, I was thrilled to see that because it's very consistent with my philosophy is that we have to have metrics, we have to have consistent metrics, and we have to be, have repeatable processes. We also have the opportunity to learn from each other. The um, One of the things that I witnessed when I went to the, the Securing the Cities meeting in Miami um, which was the one after the uh, the chairman came to uh, St. Elizabeth's, is that the state and locals are learning from each other. They're sharing information. They're supporting each other. They're going and saying, this is my best practice. This is how I work. Boston came down to New Orleans to support for Mardi Gras, and New Orleans is going up to support for the marathon next month. And working together and having the information sharing is crucial in order to have this layered defense that we've established. Excellent. Thank you very much. Doc, Dr. Sherman, um, what has GAO's report um, found regarding, regarding CWMD stakeholder outreach and engagement with SLTT partners? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So um, both with securing the cities um, as well as actually BioWatch and also the former chemical uh, defense demonstration cities initiative, we had previously found um, that the communication uh, and engagement with stakeholders, um, not only the federal level, but the SLTT partners, was not as robust as it could have been. Um, we have seen strides, uh, which is very positive. Um, there have been a lot of... Um, uh, gatherings, um, meetings, sharing of information, and really, uh, you know, kind of an understanding that one um, uh, participant in a program can learn from another. Um, we also know in 2022, there was an SLTT engagement strategy that CWMD developed. We made some recommendations on how to improve that, but it was um, no noticeable that they had pulled the strategy together. Um, and so we were pleased to have seen that. Ranking member, if you'll indulge me, I don't have an answer to the question regarding uh, a blank check, but I will say, uh, since we haven't dabbled in it, um, uh, you know, the something to keep me up at night would be the role of AI or the potential when it comes to uh, producing um, CBRN, CBRN threats. Um, that is something that, of course, is uh, part of the executive order. Uh, uh, you know, will be implemented. DHS is going to be developing um, an analysis to take a look at that issue. GAO uh, is starting to monitor the efforts within that executive order. Um, and so I'm a little less scared at night because I know we're going to take a look at it, but that is an area, um, you know, of concern moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Chairman. My time is up. Mr. Chairman, if you would just indulge me one quick final question sure. for Dr. Wolf. Um, same question on engagement. Um, as we prepare for the next health security uh, risk, share with us your, your uh, method or matrix for engagement with uh, other agencies to ensure that we have the best practices in place. Sure, Ranking Member. Uh, I'm from the Northeast, so I'll talk fast on this one. Uh, the first with our other federal partners. Uh, we are the supporting agency to ESF-8, which is the lead is HHS. And when you're a supporting agency, we need to do a better job. So the last few years of the creation of OHS, we've done a better job of being a solid partner for HHS-ASPR and HHS-CDC. 
We also sit on the FEMC, which is the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures Enterprise. That is how the federal interagency decides what medical countermeasures we should develop and invest in, certainly related to Assistant Secretary Callahan's comment about BioWatch, right? We're detecting to treat, detecting to warn. We want to make sure we're leveraging medical countermeasures. Don't want to detect something and then not have a treatment for someone in New Orleans or somewhere else. In terms of state and local, a few things we do is we convene monthly with the fusion centers, and we make sure that health analysts are understanding what's happening in the law enforcement mission. What we find a lot of times is health people tend to be called when the problem is known, so we're making sure that the fusion centers are leveraging their health analysts prior to any issue that arises. The other thing we do is we convene a communities along the southwest border and interior communities to talk about challenges they are seeing um, uh, across the community, whether that is with migrants, whether that is just state and local issues that they are devoting money from one program to another. And the last thing we do is we've got the food security mission. Uh, we've done a several tabletops, one in the state of Washington, one in Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, both of those had good representation from the tribes, which is one of our focal points for 2024, which is, as we know from COVID-19, for example, a lot of focus on Navajo Nation and making sure that we're including, when we say SLTT, that we don't forget the tribal part uh, of uh, of our state and locals. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Uh, the members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we would ask that the witnesses respond to these in writing. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7D, the hearing record will be open for 10 days. Without objection, this subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you, sir.